Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Carolyn Ward, and I'm the CEO of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. I'd like to welcome everybody to the next in our series of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation's Insiders Report. And this week, we're joined by Jordan Calloway, the development officer with the foundation, and she's gonna be talking about Flat Top Manor and the estate of Moses and Bertha Cohn. So it's gonna be a fabulous presentation with a whole lot of background and insight about the life of Moses and Bertha Cohn. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the restoration work that's on tap to start soon at Flat Top Manor. If you move your mouse over your screen, you will see down at the bottom a little Q and A. You can click that and submit a question, and we will try to get to as many of those at the end of the presentation as we can. We're also recording this webinar and we'll be sending it out later. So once again, thank you all so much for joining us. It's gonna be a fabulous presentation. If you have questions, please once again, submit them to us and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Jordan Calloway, who will give us a little insight into Flat Top Manor and Moses and Bertha Cohn's estate. Welcome, thank you for joining us. If you're with us today, you have an appreciation for Flat Top Manor, the model farm and country place of Moses and Bertha Cohn. Built in the North Carolina mountains on the Cohn's 3,600 acres, this grand home is symbolic of the era's spirit of progress. Completed in 1901, Flat Top Manor features 23 rooms and was once surrounded by a complex of supporting structures. This manor house was the country home of two first-generation Americans, Jewish and the children of German immigrants. This estate symbolized their tremendous success in textiles and their desire to share this success with others. So how did they end up in Blowing Rock? Just as we're drawn to the high country today by the cool mountain air and the beautiful vistas, so was the Cohn family. They had vacationed for quite some time in the Blowing Rock area. This photo shows Caesar Cohn and his other family members enjoying their time in Blowing Rock. So Moses and Bertha would vacation in the area and decided to build a permanent home there. They had a shared love of the high country and began purchasing property there early in their marriage. They married in 1888 and first bought property in 1892. So this is just a few years into their union. They decided to plan a, mo a model farm where they would exhibit the latest agricultural techniques. They also had a desire to better the lives of others so they could share these techniques with the larger community. So soon after purchasing property, they began to clear land for planting. Moses Cohn had crews come clear the land so they could plan all the planting for his fruit orchards, vegetable gardens, flower gardens. Uh, he had 25 miles of carriage trails. He acquired livestock, sheep, and cattle to feature on their model farm. He also imported deer for, from Pennsylvania for two deer parks that he had on the property. This involved years of detailed planning. Moses Cohn, as many of you know, focused particularly on apples. He had a great faith in this fruit. As he said, I believe in apples. So Moses Cohn eventually planted 30,000 apple trees on his property in up to 90 different varieties of apples. He brought in experts from all over the country and wrote to, to anyone who could help him better his knowledge on this fruit. Moses Cohn was one of the largest textile manufacturers in the world. And he, he oversaw the mill that was the world's largest denim manufacturer. But on his passport application, he put his occupation as farmer. So this is how he identified. The newspapers at the time referred to him as Farmer Cone. So once he'd done all this planning for the beautiful grounds on his estate, who would design the home of Bertha and Moses Cone? So just as he did with his factories, Moses Cohn had to have the very best. So he approached the top architectural firm in the country, McKim, Mead, and White. Bertha went to New York City and met with Stanford White. Unfortunately, the price that that firm wanted was a bit high. So Moses Cohn made a more practical choice, and he essentially hired a company man. 
an architect named Orlo Epps, who worked in Greensboro, and you can see his letterhead here on this slide. Orlo Epps had designed the, the Cone Export and Commission Building in Greensboro, and he also designed several other projects in the area. He had a short but prolific career in Greensboro. He designed the two main buildings at what is now UNCG. He also designed his own personal home, which is still standing in the College Hill area. It's the red building at the bottom of the slide. He lived in this area because not only was Orlo Epps an architect, he was also a professor. He taught at what is now North Carolina A&T, a historically black university. He was a very interesting person. He was not only an architect and a professor, but he was also an inventor and he dabbled in economics. He later wrote a book on socialism, which is very interesting considering he was building a house for one of the richest men in Greensboro. So this house that he designed for Moses and Bertha Cohn in the high country, what would it feature? Of course, it had to have the latest innovations. So not only did the grounds feature the latest agricultural innovations to display for surrounding communities, the house featured the latest technology. So they had hot and cold running water. And as the people of, of Blowing Rock could see, um, you can see Flat Top off in the distance here. The day they turned on the lights at Flat Top Manor was a special day indeed, as they had carbide gas lighting in the home. So he brought modern technology to the high country. But of course, technology that he depended on for continuing to run his businesses, he required communication. So he had a telephone system installed. So it was the first private home with a telephone in the high country area. So he was able to continue to communicate with his colleagues in Greensboro, New York. He could also easily access Greensboro thanks to the Lenore train. So he could leave Greensboro in the morning and make it to Blowing Rock by nightfall. He depended on this because not only was he developing this huge estate in the high country, but he was continuing with his brother Caesar to develop his textile business. And what did his business associates when they visited Flat Top Manor see? Well, they were greeted by a beautiful home that's much different than the home we see today. Bertha Cohn was known as a meticulous housekeeper who insisted upon perfection. Guests of the day have noted that the floors were gleaming, highly polished. They were topped by Turkish rugs. There was porcelain from Japan and Asia on every surface. They displayed their treasures that they had collected from around the world. This wooden tray on the bottom right is from China, and this belonged to Bertha. But Etta Cohn, Moses' sister, had a similar tray because she admired it so much. She picked it up on their trip. So surprisingly, this home in the high country of North Carolina in the first few years of the 1900s featured works of art by modern artists. This may not seem shocking to you today, but they had works by Pablo Picasso, who was not a known entity at this time. The Cohn sisters were among the very first to collect Pablo Picasso. They first met him in 1905, and this study that's shown here on the left, Woman with Loaves, was a gift from Etta to Bertha Cohn. It belonged to Bertha, and it was on display in the library at Flat Top Manor. This study was for a work that was eventually part of the collection of Philadelphia Museum of Art. So while it's a rather traditional work, this is a very cutting edge piece to have in your home, as Picasso was a very modern artist. They also had two works by Renoir. Le Chapeau et Pangle was the hat pin, which the original lithograph was luckily in our exhibit that we partnered with Brahm on last year. And we were able to borrow this from a Cohn family member. There was a third Renoir in the house as well, which we did not have access to. So how did these great works of art end up at Flat Top Manor? Well, Moses Cohn was the oldest in a very large German Jewish family, 13 children. Moses and his brother Caesar, as the two oldest siblings, had a certain amount of responsibility for the rest of the family, especially their unmarried sisters. So from a young age, they helped their father with his business, his dry goods business, and they eventually partnered with him. So this cigar box is in the collection at Appalachian State University, and it shows Herman Cohn, who emigrated from Germany to Virginia on the far left, 
Moses Cone, Caesar Cone, and Monroe Cone, who there's been less written about him as he died before age 30. So while the brothers went to work early with their father and devoted their life to their, textile, their dry goods and then textile business, the sisters lived a very different life. Much has been written about the two famous art collectors, Clarabelle and Etta Cone. They lived a life filled with culture and travel. There was a third sister, though, the oldest sister, Carrie Cone Long, who eventually settled in another Parkway community, Asheville. And she lived a very different life than her two unmarried sisters. She spent a lot, her life devoted to her family, to her faith, and to her community. Her husband managed one of the Cone family mills in Asheville. So back to the two Cone sisters to, who collected. Clarabelle is shown here on the far left. She was a physician who graduated at the top of her class from the Women's Medical College of Baltimore. And Etta on the far right who preferred music and art and tended to care for family members. They befriended Gertrude Stein, who was also a, Ger a German Jewish woman who lived in the Baltimore area. And of course, Gertrude Stein would be, later be well known as an author and an art collector as well. So it was through the Stein family that they met Picasso and later Matisse, whom they've mostly been associated with due to their major collection of Matisse works. Bertha Cohn, Moses' wife, was, as her sisters-in-law, a Jewish woman from Baltimore. She was also extremely close with her siblings. Her two closest siblings were Clem and So, who are shown in this photo. And I hope you can appreciate Bertha's hat. She's the one on the far right with the very fashionable hat. So how did Bertha and Moses meet? They were part of a close-knit Jewish community in Baltimore. We're uncertain of when their, cross, when their paths first crossed, but possibly it was as teenagers. There is a record where Rabbi Benjamin Zold, who was a major religious leader at the time in Baltimore, oversaw a ceremony for 10 boys and eight girls at the temple. And among the 10 boys and eight girls were Carrie Cohn, the eldest Cohn sister, and Jacob Lindau, who was a younger brother of Bertha Lindau Cohn. We know for sure that Moses and Bertha had met by 1884. This is when they went on their first date, and it was to a horse race. They went to Pimlico, which is a well-known horse track in Baltimore. And I think this is fabulous, considering the Cone State's long connection with horses. If you've been there and enjoyed the carriage trails, which have always been open to the public, they've long been associated with horses. And here's some other photos of Caesar Cone with his horse-drawn carriage in Greensboro and on a horseback. So the first date must have been a success. As they married at the Lindau family home, the ceremony was officiated by Rabbi Zold on February 15, 1888. And as I said, a few years later, they started planning their high country home. This home would be a model farm that would benefit others. They would also use their estate to entertain business guests. It was a recreational paradise. This photo, this beautiful photo of Bath Lake, shows it was one of two stocked lakes, Bath Lake and Trout Lake, on the property. They also had a bowling alley on the property, a tennis court, a croquet lawn. It was a wonderland for their guests. And it was also wonderful for the surrounding community as they allowed others to come on their grounds. All that they asked was for people to not hunt on their property. Of course, their most favored guests were their family members. And I wanted to include this slide as it's a postcard that Etta Cohn sent to her friend Gertrude Stein in Florence, Italy. And she carefully noted on the back that this red roof was inappropriate, that the roof was still green. But I just think it's wonderful to think that you could go into town and purchase a postcard with your brother's house on the front. So while Moses and Bertha Cohn are developing this major country estate in the high country, Moses Cohn and his brother Caesar are building their textile empire. It caused him a great amount of stress. His health was declining. He had personal and professional conflicts while he was building this textile empire. So to alleviate his stress, he decided he would go on a trip around the world with his sisters. As I said, the sisters had gone on annual trips to Europe and had begun their art collections. 
this was an opportunity for them to share culture and expand the education of their brother and Bertha. Moses Cohn had gone to work early and had always been completely busy with his textile business. This was a chance for him to, as they said, drink in the culture. So he thoroughly enjoyed his time with his beloved sisters, but sadly his health continued to decline. And when he returned from the around the world trip, he worsened and the stress overcame him. And he eventually passed away in December of 1908 in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins where he was being treated. He wanted to be back home though. So his body was put on a train and sent back to Blowing Rock so he could be buried there at Plateau Manor. Bertha was lost without him. He was her life partner. They had no children. He had left no will. She wasn't sure how to proceed. She fell into a deep depression. Etta Cohn spent three summers with her to aid her in her grief. Etta was equally grief stricken. So the family came to an agreement and decided how they would move ahead. Moses's business shares and the entire estate would be held in a trust to benefit the people of Greensboro so that they could build a much needed hospital. The grounds and the house would be kept as a memorial park, Moses H. Cohn Memorial Park, and they would continue to keep the grounds open to the public as they wished. So now Bertha had a plan and she could move ahead and she could continue the plans that she and Moses had made together. So she began to make progress on the estate in 1911. She expanded the kitchen. She added this balustrade that you can see here at the front. She made plans for a dairy. She created the first grade A dairy in Watauga County. She would later have the cream and butter shipped to Baltimore and to other family members. She continued to host family members on the estate. She frequently had her Lindau family members come and stay with her. We've been very lucky that the two Lindau nieces, Judith Lindau McConnell and Nancy Lindau Lewis, helped us very much through the years. They sat for oral history interviews with Appalachian State University. They've drawn diagrams for us. They toured the house with us. They've loaned objects. So we're very indebted to them and their family members. Sadly, we lost Nancy Lewis recently. Bertha Cohn managed the estate on her own for almost four decades. She was frequently uh, aided by her sisters who stayed with her, but essentially she was independent and had all of this on her shoulders for 40 years. She died in 1947 and was, and was buried at Flat Top Manor, as were her sisters, Clem and Sophie. So after her death, the hospital realized that they could not manage the estate in the high country, and so they turned it over to us, to the American people. It's part of the National Park Service now. So the National Park Service made it part of the Blue Ridge Parkway. The Blue Ridge Parkway is, of course, a tremendous park, 469 miles and numerous structures. So the National Park Service had to prioritize, and they prioritized the manor house. They were forced to remove over 50, 50 buildings on the estate, but they continued to care for the manor house and the grounds and kept the grounds open to the American public. Over 200,000 guests a year visit Flat Top Manor, and sadly, this is the house that they see as a wooden structure in the high country facing high winds. It's weather beaten. It needs critical care. This is where the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation comes in. We are the primary fundraiser for the Blue Ridge Parkway. So we are assisting them with the many needs of Flat Top Manor and the estate. Some of the things that we've accomplished thanks to our donors' tremendous support is we've expanded the outreach and interpretation for Flat Top Manor. Uh, several years ago, we commissioned a play about the design and creation of Flat Top Manor. We've also worked with Tim Larson to create a map that we make available to guests on the ground, and we print and give away for free thousands of copies of this map each year. We also funded the work necessary to have the estate placed on the National Historic Registry. We've also funded multiple cultural landscape reports. We've also funded an intern who's done further research on the estate. There's so much that can be learned about this wonderful place. 
Every year we have an annual celebration in Blowing Rock. Last year we were lucky enough to hold it on the grounds of the estate. It's the denim ball. Sadly, this year we will not hold the denim ball, so there will be income lost because of that cancellation. We've been very lucky to have tremendous support from the community, to have tremendous support from Cone family members to continue to support Flat Top Manor. The photo on the bottom right shows some of our valuable volunteers posing with the park superintendent, J.D. Lee. So what have we gotten done? So far, we have completed uh, replacing the balustrade on the front lawn. You can see it here in front of the house. We've replaced the flat roof. We've also replaced the balusters that line this roof. We also installed a fire suppression system, which is a very expensive and cumbersome project, but much needed in order to protect this 120 year old wooden house. This summer, as the house has been closed to the public and there's been no guests allowed, we've been able to expand cone interpretation using technology. We had a crew, crew come in and photo and video the interior of the house. This way, when the house is closed, as it is a seasonal operation, then it can be available to guests all over the world. This video doesn't do it justice, but there is some really amazing videos that we're going to have available for people to see. This has all been funded thanks to our donors. So what's next? What's on the horizon? Our upcoming projects are to work with the park on expanding parking options. We currently don't have enough access for visitors. We are growing our volunteer program. We have a critical crew of volunteers that are working there on the ground. The big project we have lying ahead is completing the exterior rehabilitation of Flat Top Manor, which is desperately needed. So how can you be a part of this? You can support these efforts and help protect the legacy of Moses and Bertha Cohn. We will be continuing the exterior rehabilitation thanks to the work of the Denver Service Center, which is the National Park Services Agency that oversees the planning, design, and construction management for America's cultural treasures. And Flat Top Manor, I think we can agree, is one of America's cultural treasures. Thank you for joining us today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, every time I learn more about the manor house and the estate, it is amazing that we all have this uh, national treasure that we have such easy access to and often take for granted. And so thank you again for the presentation. We have time for just a couple questions. Um, one of the questions, did Moses and Bertha Cohn <clears throat> stock the fish in the lake and how did they use them? They did stock the lakes um, and he was a fisherman. We have photos of him fishing in Florida and we know he fished at Bass Lake. Um, we also have letters from later on after Moses passed where family members would be sure to write ahead and ask Bertha if they could come up and fish. Okay and we've got time for just a couple more do you have a rough idea of the timeline for when the exterior renovations on the manor house will happen? We know that uh, COVID has changed park operations and facilities that open and, and close and when all of that is occurring. Do we have any idea of a timeline? You can probably help me with that as well. Uh, I know that we were hopeful that this work would have started earlier. It has been delayed but we are meeting on a weekly basis with the park to finalize this plan. So in terms of the schedule, I know that the, the contract is being finalized in the coming weeks for sure. Yeah, and I think I've learned recently that we hope um, some work will happen this year. We had, again, as Jordan said, hoped it would start in the spring, but we do think their work will begin this fall and get as much done as we can before the weather sets in and the remainder of the work will be completed in 2021. Uh, any of you that have been in the high country know what weather can be like there. So we are moving forward. It has been amazing what the Park Service has been able to do given the closures and COVID-19 and the impacts that it's had. So we are so thankful for the partnership of the National Park Service staff, 
of the Denver Service Center, of the region. Uh, the region office in Atlanta has been very supportive of this project. And it is an icon along the Blue Ridge Parkway. And so we are very thankful for the support of our community of stewards and our donors, the community members, organizations that have stepped up, the volunteers, and the staff of the Blue Ridge Parkway that has worked very tirelessly amidst everything else they're trying to do to help ensure that we're protecting the Manor House to, for years to come. And then one final question. Let's see, we have a whole lot of questions that are coming in. When I make a donation to the foundation, am I assured that money will go exclusively to Cone Manor? How do I make sure when I give a donation that the money is used for what I intend it to be used for? Yes, I'm happy to answer that. We carefully designate each gift that comes in. We do receive a certain amount of unrestricted gifts, but if a donor tells us that they want it for a certain project like Cone Manor, that's how it's entered. And that's how it will be used. All right, fabulous. Once again, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, we will try to continue to answer as many questions as we can that are coming in. We will have this recorded and made available to everyone. Thank you all for your support of the foundation, for your support of the Blue Ridge Parkway. This is our national treasure. It happens to be in our backyard, but it's shared by millions all over the world. So thank you so much for helping us preserve and protect the stories, the places that hold the memories for us and the promises for the experiences to come. So thank you all so much and have a great day and maybe we'll see you on the estate one day soon. Thank you.